what if all we had was one particular book of the Bible? Would that be enough? Especially if it's one of the New Testament books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Acts, you name it. Would that be enough? Because what we forget sometimes is that the way we see the Bible is not necessarily the way that those at the time of the writing of the Bible or even immediately after the Bible was completed, how they saw it. Because remember, they didn't have access to all of the books. They may have heard of the things that are entailed in some of the books, but let's say all you had was the book of Romans. That's the only letter that you had. Would that have been enough? Well, sure. Certain books, without question, we will we would know enough from that book. What if all you had was the book of Matthew? Same thing. You would have enough, one, to place your faith in Christ and to live a godly life. What about the book of John? And I think that book even more so than the other books, would give you far more, or at least enough to live off of, to, to understand what the gospel is, to understand how you ought to live, to understand what God is doing. And so if you had just the book of John, which we're going to look at, would you know enough? Because I think there is this misnomer that states that uh, a proof text is a bad thing. Well, it's not. Because remember, every word that's given, uh, especially if you can understand the context of that particular proof text, well, then it's not a bad thing. Now, should a proof text ever contradict any other text? No. If it does, then we've got, we've got a bad understanding of that particular text, or at least the context of that text. But when you look at the book of John, there's a lot of hemming and hawing over certain things that are stated. And I just want to go look at it, particularly in John chapter 6. Starting in verse 37, working our way down to verse 47. We may go a little further, but I want to see, is there a way to look at the, this particular book, this particular chapter, the set of verses in this chapter? Is there a way to look at it differently? For example, you all know that I believe that a person cannot lose their salvation. So when I look at these passages, if I believe the opposite, if I believe that you could lose your salvation, how could I take those passages to believe that? Is there a way or... Do I have to look at these passages, kind of shake my head, go, hmm, and then say, okay, but these other passages, because what if all I had was these passages? What if all I had was this book? So it couldn't be that I need the other books to understand John, particularly John 6. So I want to look at this and see, is there a way to look at these passages to see if maybe the other side could be, you know, there's some validity to what they're saying. So if I go to John chapter 6. Let's say, where do I, I, I said, I'll start from verse, let, let's start in verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Uh, and by the way, we're going to have to, because we want to do an in-depth look at this. We want to look at it from the Greek. The person that comes to me, ha erkamenos, the person that is coming to him, uh, ume panase, which is, will never hunger. And this is the emphatic double negation this is a double negation of a subjunctive. So when we see a double negation of a subjunctive, it is one of the most emphatic ways of saying it can never, ever happen. And because of the subjunctive, the possibility of it happening can never happen, even in the future. That's what's implied. That's, the, that's just the rule. OK, so if I say they may never hunger, I mean with the ume, they may never, ever, ever hunger, no matter what happens in even including something in the future. So he says, the one coming to me will never, ever, ever hunger. Uh, and the one believing, this word is important also, ha pistuan. Remember, every time that the Bible describes a believer, not every time, but most often it's someone who is in this with this participle. This is a present active participle. This person is believing. So the one, the believing ones that's in him will never, ever, ever, same thing, thirst, dip, Dipsese, which is also now this is not a a, a, a a subjunctive, unlike the the word for hunger is a subjunctive. This is a future active indicative, and so the two most emphatic ways to deny something from happening are here. This person will never ever. As a matter of fact, the the never ever is also added to it just to give even extra emphasis. Uh, but this person can never ever in the future thirst, meaning. They came to him, they believe in him, and so whatever happens, whatever's going to happen in the future, it seems to be signifying that they will never, ever thirst. Well, that's kind of in keeping with what we see in, in John 4, right, when he's speaking to the woman at the well. So it'd be hard just so far grammatically to say, well, I can see a person not being saved, a person losing their salvation according to this. 
because you have to keep believing. You have to keep coming. But is that what the passage says? Now, it says the person, now it does use the word whoever in English, but the word that's used here is ekamenos, which is the person that's coming. Uh, this is the person, this is a uh, middle participle. So the middle voice uh, is a participle. So this does, in, this does kind of convey coming um, often, all the time, the ing part, so fine. Uh, but then the person is believing. So is this saying that if you keep coming, or is this saying that the person that is coming, that's what they're doing. They're constantly coming. Same thing with the person that's believing. I don't see the condition there. And there are some words in Greek that we can look forward to say, well, I see the condition. An if. And there are different ways to say that in Greek. You can say that eon or eon may, uh, if or if not, unless uh, there's a, a hati, there is henna. Those words kind of indicate that there is some sort of condition or the reason why something has happened. And then we get to verse 37. We haven't gotten to verse 37 yet. Uh, verse 36, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. You see me and yet you don't believe. Verse 37, all the Father gives me will come. Now, the question here is, is there any way to where we can make this verse dependent upon us? Is there any way to make this verse have some sort of condition? Meaning, if we keep coming to him, then we'll be the ones that the Father will give. And then by that logic, we'll also come. You can't say that there. You can't, you can't apply a condition, at least I can't see one. You can't apply a condition here in verse 37 because the condition or what's happening has nothing to do with you, even though it affects you. He says, all that the Father gives, pan ha didosin, all the Father gives, and this is the present active indicative. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to keep giving, but I would say that all that the Father is giving, not always will it mean that, but I think in this case, it does mean all that the ones that he is giving to me, the Father, to me, they will come. So he says that all the ones that he is, and I, I, I'm trying to stress this importantly, there's a reason why, all the ones that he's giving to me, all the ones that the Father is giving to me, they will come. And this word here is hexe, which is a future active indicative. Jesus is stating that they will come. Who is the they that will come? All the ones that the Father is giving. So whoever that is, Mary, Frank, John, Marty, Gino, Herschel, uh, Betty, whoever, whoever's included in the all, he says they will. And who all, so two things can be stated from this. All of those people were given to Jesus by the Father, and all of those people will come to him. I think that part is pretty clear. I, it'd be hard, difficult to see any other way. And the ones coming to me, I will never, ever cast out. Now, this word, Erkamen, let's drop back, go back up, because it's not the first time we saw this, even in this chapter. It's the same word that's used here. Those who are coming to him, so the ones that are coming to him are the same as those that he gave. So far, you all understand what I'm saying. The ones in chapter 6, 35, he says the ones that are coming to me, so we couldn't even add a condition on these people. The ones who are coming to him shall never thirst or hunger. He's also stating that the ones that are coming to him are the very same ones that will come are the very same ones that he gave. Okay? I think that's important because thus far, I, I just don't see thus far how it can, a person can say that there's a condition attached to us that we have to keep doing this. OK, so the ones that are coming to him, which are the very same ones that he says will come, which are the very same ones that were given. Uh, he will never, ever, ever cast out this Ume Ekbalo. This is also the this is the uh, Eris active uh, subjunctive. So he will never, ever, the possibility of him casting them out is gone, no matter what happens in the future, because that's the rule. Uh, then he says, for I have come down to do the will of my father. So he even tells why he gives kind of a reason, a little added reason as to why they won't be cast out ever. This word hati, this is a condition that's added to it or the explanation as to why. Because he has come down from heaven not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the reason why they won't ever be cast out is because of this will of the Father that he's come to do. And this is the will of him who sent me, 
that I should lose none. Here it is. In order that all of the ones, and I, I want to focus on this word right here. Let me highlight this, this word henna, this all or this henna, it is what's called a purpose. clause. It starts a purpose clause off. It's so that this is the reason why the purpose of this, the purpose of him coming is so that all of the ones that were given to him. Now, this part, I want to pause a little bit. I want to really get you guys to see what's happening here. Because I think just so far, I think it, it I think it just solidifies the impossibility of a person who has been given to Christ to ever fall away, to ever leave. Let's go back to it. The reason why he came, the purpose of him coming, this henna, in order that all of who? All the ones. Now, notice this is in the perfect tense. The perfect tense is a completed action from the past. So all of the ones that had been given to Jesus by the Father in the past are the very same ones that, as far as we know, he's still giving. What does that mean? Mary, John, and Frank, who are not saved yet, who will be saved, they are the ones who are who God is giving. But Jesus makes the point known because this word here, the Dokin, perfect tense, he had given them to Jesus in the past. So he gave them to Jesus in the past, though he's giving them now. We see them as being giving now, being given now. But God gave them past tense, perfect tense in the past. And all those ones that he gave in the past to him, to Jesus, he says, me apaleso, which is they will not, he will not lose any. He will not lose any out of it. Out of what? Out of the it, the out to is out of the ones that were given. He will not lose one out of the ones that were given, but he will raise them up in the last day. So far, it again, to me, and I could be wrong, I don't see it though. I'm, I'm trying to use English and the Greek, the Greek even more so. We see this a little bit more clear in the Greek. There's just no way that a person could find them way, their way out of because so far, thus far from verses 35 through verses 39, we don't see the condition upon the man. We don't see that this person has to do something to be in him and to stay in him. We we just don't see that. Well, Corey, are you saying that a person doesn't have to believe? Of course a person has to believe. But implicit in what's being stated here is that the person will believe because they were the ones that gave him. How do we know a person will believe? Because he says, Jesus says, going back up to it, he says all that the ones that he's given, he says that he, they will come. All the verse 37, I'm sorry, all the ones that he's given, he says they will come to him. So the coming to him means they will believe in him. How do we know so? Because in 35, he says these are the ones, the same ones that are coming to him and the same ones that are believing. So what's what has to happen in order for you to be saved, the coming and believing, he says they will do. Are you guys with me so far? So now if we drop down to verse 40, let's pick it back up. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son of Man, and by the way, the word that's used here is the, the Oron, which is a part of So these people are, notice again, the Bible describes us as in this state of doing so. There's this, the aspect that's given that, that we are going to be continually, in this case, looking on the Son. We're going to keep believing on the Son. This is the will of him. That those that the ones that uh, are in order that all the ones that are looking on on the sun and are believing there's a word pistuan that are believing in him they have life. Notice this statement right here. They have eke. It is present tense. They have it. They have life. When right now they have it now. They have life. Zoane, Ionian, life eternal, life into the ages, and he will raise them up. He will in the last day. Same statement. So, so far, Jesus has been pretty clear, as clear as he possibly can be. Now, is there another way that I can think of? I can't. Now, granted, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not some great Greek scholar, but thus far, I can't think of a, of a clearer way that he could have put it to state that I'm going to give these people to my son. And all the ones that come to him, the son will never, ever cast out. He, as a matter of fact, he won't lose any. So whatever way that you want to try to 
couch this that the person could leave on their own, walk away, stop believing. Jesus says that he will not lose anyone, not anyone. Okay. I don't, I don't know if there's a clearer way that he could have put it. If there is, I would love for someone to say so. Someone to say, well, Corey, if he, he didn't mean that. So my question would be, if he didn't mean that he could lose not one and none would ever perish, what is the Greek way to say? What's the Greek way to say that they will never, ever perish, no matter what? What is the Greek way to say that he? it's impossible to lose someone? What's the Greek way to say that if you are saved today, you'll never be unsaved? What is the best Greek way to say so? I would love to hear that. The question is, or the problem is, there is no great Greek way to say it other than the way that he said it thus far. That's the problem. Let's go back to it. Verse 41. So the Jews, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life. I'm sorry, the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say I have come down from heaven? Well, they're missing the boat, aren't they? Uh, Jesus said to them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one here, he's, he, he's shooting at them right now. He says, no one can come to me unless, and here's the, the if or the unless uh, that we said earlier that's missing as a condition for being saved. Earlier, eon may, unless, if not, that's what that's these words right here, eon is if, may, not. So if not or unless, the father, the one that sent me, if he draws them, unless he draws them, he says that that's the only way. Unless, if not, the Father draws you, you cannot come. And I will raise him. And Jesus, what does he do? He reiterates what he says. And I will raise him in the last day. He's already said that twice. It's the third time he's saying, I will raise him in the last day. Raise who? The same one that the Father has. That the Father draws. The same one that the Father gives or has been given. That it is giving and has given. The very same one, the very same one that he says he will not lose, not one. The will of him is to come that he, in order that he would not lose one. That's important, by the way. The will of him, he came to do this will. In order for him, in order for no one to be lost, he came. Why is that important? Well, remember, backing up a little bit, Jesus makes this statement also in John 3, and he's piggybacking off of everything that was stated in the Old Testament. Under the Old Covenant, you, your sins can be atoned for, but you can still thereafter be lost. And so he comes in order that none of those would be lost. Let's go back to verse 44. He says, and I will raise him on the last day. Again, reiterating what he's been trying to get across through our or their thick heads. He says, is it written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God? That's a, guys, that's, that's important. They, it has been written in the prophets and they will all, all, who's the they? Not just everybody, obviously, but he's speaking about a certain all, those that have been given. All of them will be taught by God. Very important. And so everyone or all the ones that that hear or heard and uh, I'm sorry, the father from the father uh, and have learned from the father, that person comes to me. So if you've heard from the father, notice how he puts that though as well. I think that's interesting. If you had heard from the father, or heard from the Father, put it the way, actually the way it's written, heard from the Father, um, and have learned from the Father. What does he say? You, you will come to him. He's even using this, the basic past tense. If you heard, uh, this is Aris, active participle, have heard or have been hearing, uh, then you will come. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he was from God, he has seen the Father. Look what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you. Truly, truly, I say to you that whoever in the word, whoever is not really the word, whoever is the high pistol one, the one that's believing. And we've we've already discovered and discussed and determined who the one that is believing is. That very same person. He has. So if you believe the person that believes. He eke zoe naonian. He has life at that moment, at that very moment. Right now. That's the whole point of using the present active indicative. Right now, that person has. Remember, words have meaning. Even if we don't understand the words ourselves, that doesn't, doesn't negate the fact they have a meaning. Because we're ignorant of it doesn't mean that we should make everyone else be ignorant of it. Because we don't know doesn't mean that no one else could know. And so when someone is showing you, we're showing you now that 
if you believe you have it right now, life into the ages. You have what now? Life. How long do you have it? Into the ages. So where does that stop? It can't. So he says, your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that they, so that the one, so that one may eat of it and not die. So that one may eat of it and that person would not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give to him for life, for, uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. Meaning what? I'm going to die for them. Why is that important? Because what Jesus is stating that when I die, I'm going to fulfill what the law required. I'm going to atone for sin. My flesh is what I'm speaking of. I'm going to give it as a ransom. So that way, that's what he meant by in order that all the believing ones will never perish. So as I look at this passage, as I look at this passage, I don't see one. If you notice, there was no condition in this for those that are his. The only condition that that's put about is that the only way that you can come to him, the only condition that we see thus far is that he has to do it. He has to draw, which makes sense because he says that all the father gives. So if the father didn't give, meaning that he didn't draw you, then you can't say that you will come. He says those, those, those that he did give, those that he did draw, they will come and he will not throw or cast out any one of them. I just can't find a way, and I've tried to. I, I, I promise you guys, I've tried over and over. And so I asked someone, if there is, since since words have different ranges and nuances and so forth, tell me those that would disagree, and or even those that agree, ask your friends who would disagree. What would the Bible have to say for you to believe that you can't lose your salvation? How would the Bible, how would Jesus have to put it in order for you to agree that you cannot lose your salvation? What's the most emphatic way that Jesus could have said to you that you can't lose your salvation? More than likely, he said it. I'm, I'm pretty sure he has. But I would love to hear what someone who disagrees, what is the emphatic way to say that you can lose your salvation? What is it, or what is the emphatic way, I'm sorry, what's the emphatic way for Jesus to say or the Bible say that you cannot lose it? What's the, what's, what is that way? How would you say so in Greek? But until then, we see how Jesus says, and these, these are his words. These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. And so the question is, if you're not going to take those, if you're not going to take these words and instead you're going to go to other passages and look and look and look and search and search and search with all your fervor, with all your heart to find a way for this not to be true. Now we've got a problem. So I would be interested to hear what someone has to say. I would love to hear it. I would love a response. And I'm going to get some, but they won't. But when we give the response back, I said, okay, this is how you could say in the Greek, how you can never lose your salvation. And then we say, okay, well, he just did. What will be the response? Likely they'll, they'll deny that as well. So for those of you, though, that are looking for more encouragement, and I think it's important that you be encouraged and know that this, con this is the confidence that Paul has in us about he who began a good work in us, the same confidence we can have because Paul, Paul, the writer of Hebrews says you will have need of this confidence in this day. As more and more things are happening, you will have need of this confidence. You need to be confident that what God has done, he has done completely. He's going to finish it. And the one thing you don't have to worry about with all the things that are on your mind is losing your salvation. You don't have to be in despair. You don't have to be in doubt because what God has done, he's promised to do and he will complete it. Amen.